We achieved the same footage in the first 135 days that we planned, even though we were stopped for a month with the uh, Longshoreman picket line. So the machine performed and advanced much faster than we were anticipating that it would during those first 135 days. So it's not like the machine hasn't gotten out of the starting blocks and hasn't performed. It's uh, we're at a point now where um, there's been some damage to the seals and, and that's something that needs to be corrected before we move on. There's a, a set of five seals there. Uh, that's part of the investigation that we're, we're doing. There's, there's a joint effort between uh, STP senior management, Hitachi Zosen senior management, um, our tunneling team, and the uh, tunnel machine experts that we have and the ones that Hitachi Zosen has. We're all addressing this problem. The most important thing is that whatever we do, we want to make sure that the machine's 100% and that we've identified uh, what cause the problem to occur so we can prevent it from occurring again as we uh, move forward with the tunneling. We believe that there was uh, pretty significant damage to the cutting tools and if the cutting tools are damaged or severely worn then you're really just pushing like a flat plate up against the soil so you're just relying on the pressure of the machine to uh, basically have that material flow through the openings in an extruded fashion. That makes the clogging of those openings much more likely than if you have uh, the cutting tools on the face of the cutter head cutting the soil as, as the machine's designed to do. So this is a picture of the cutter head. These spokes here, these large ones, these eight spokes, these are the ones where we can go in from behind inside the machine crawl up and we can change these ones that you see in the center. But these scraper bits, if, if these are damaged enough, that portion of the cutter head is just pushing against the soil and not cutting into the soil. We changed a significant number of tools by going through the spokes and then when we did the hyperbaric interventions we changed more cutting tools on the cutter head. Friction usually causes temperature, so if the cutter head's not cutting, you're pushing this plate against the face and rotating it, and it's just rubbing against the dirt instead of cutting into the dirt. So that creates friction there. In, in the main bearing and the rotation of the cutter head, uh, the seals are there. They're filled with grease. They're to lubricate. Um, the space between a rotating metal piece and a stationary metal piece and if those are damaged in some way and there's there's some friction introduced there uh, you can generate heat that way so it could have happened uh, inside the machine where the seals and grease are acting to uh, keep those two adjoining pieces of metal from coming into contact with each other or creating friction which would create heat in a similar way that the cutting tools on the cutter head are there to scrape the dirt as the cutter head rotates so the, so the face of the cutter head isn't shoved up against the dirt and creating friction as the cutter head rotates. The machine was assembled in Japan it turned out that um, the structural capacity of the, of the surrounding housing, so to speak, uh, wasn't strong enough. And when this heavy piece was set in there, there was some deflection. So it, it became more oval instead of round, which created some spots where metal to metal came into contact. It was structurally retrofitted to make it much stronger. It was reassembled again rotated and tested and, and everything worked fine. So it's, it's something that affected the same part of the machine but for a different reason. Uh, we believe the bearing is functioning from what we've been able to determine that the bearing is fine. Uh, the bearing manufacturer uh, will be uh, coming here to uh, recertify the bearing at that time we'll uh, know for sure whether the bearing is 100% or if it has any damage. The machine's designed to replace the main bearing from inside the tunnel. It's complicated and difficult, but the machine is designed 
so that that can be accomplished if it needs to be accomplished. And again, I know that um, we have a spare bearing as to its exact location. I don't know, but I know that it's readily available in the event that we need to have it here to replace the existing main bearing. Our, and, our, and there's a provision in the contract that we have to have a spare main bearing uh, precisely for this type of reason. So again, it's, it's, it's something that wasn't even unanticipated by WashDOT because they put in the contract that we need to have a spare main bearing. Yeah, it's our understanding that it's, it's overseas and the shipping time would not be a hold <coughs> up because by the time it was determined that the bearing was needed, there's still enough work that needs to be done to actually access it and swap it out that would match the shipping time to get it here. We entered into a contract. It's a design-build contract. Uh, the contract uh, allocates risk between the parties, that being WashDOT and Seattle Tunnel Partners. Um, it identifies um, what things would be uh, compensable to the contractor, one th what things are not compensable to the contractor. And we're having uh, discussions with WashDOT about the contractual issues and if uh, if the contract provides for us to be compensated uh, for some aspect of uh, the costs associated with this delay, then uh, we would pursue that recovery of costs under the contract. So you're There's a fund in the contract for $40 million that covers differing site conditions and covers additional hyperbaric interventions and what we have in our bid is 1,440 hours of hyperbaric intervention so as we tunnel along if we exceed that amount then that fund would be access to pay for those additional hyperbaric interventions when the contracts complete whatever's left in the fund we get 75 percent of that fund and WashDOT gets 25 percent so if we never use the fund at the end of the project, we get $30 million of that and $10 million goes to WashDOT. We, we, we've got some things that we can do to recover schedule. We don't know what the extent of this delay will be because we don't know exactly what needs to be done and how we're going to go about doing that. But once that's known and once we determine how much uh, schedule time we can recover, then we'll be able to determine whether there's a delay to contract completion or not. But it will be months to delay. We don't know that yet. It'll be, it'll be months to get the TBM up and running again, but whether that translates into months of delay to contract completion remains to be seen.